So thank you guys all for coming. Thank you wonderful, wonderful writers for being here. I'm such a big fan of all of your work and it feels so wonderful to be up here. Appreciate you asking me to moderate. Uh, I really just want to start, I feel like it's a good place to start with the cops coming for us. Uh, the word raunchy. Uh, it came up in some reviews of yours, Emily. I just want to talk a little bit about the way in which we, and especially in criticism, uh, talk about female writing and female characters. So it's, it's really funny. We were talking a little bit before this event. Can everyone hear? Okay, good. And um, we were talking a little bit before this event, and I was saying that I really didn't expect that my novel, The Blondes, was going to be... I didn't think it had a bad woman in it. I thought it had a woman who was in her 20s. <laughs> Period. And if anything, I thought that she was a little bit um, hesitating and a little bit faltering and that she was someone who was trying to find out who she was and that she had made a few mistakes. Um, but I certainly didn't think of her as bad. And I got, I did, I got some great reviews, so I don't want to complain. But one of the reviews that I got called the book Raunchy. And when I... Th Step back and thought about it. I went back over the book, and there is an affair in the book with a married man, and there is a young woman trying to get an abortion. Um, but when I looked at the sex scenes in the book, there really were only three, and they weren't particularly explicit. And I thought, well, how do we have this kind of judgment on women? You know, and I, although she's a fictional character, I just I thought that it might relate to what some of the other women that I know are writing and, and how it's being seen when it goes out into the world. And so that was one of the things that we were talking about with the word raunchy, is how does a book that's 400 pages and only has three sex scenes get called raunchy? Is it because it has a female protagonist? Is it because it's by a woman? Would a man who writes a book that's 400 pages that only has three sex scenes have that banner put on him? I mean, I feel like a man who writes a book and it's just one long sex scene. Uh, Still doesn't have that banner put Philip on Philip Roth. Yeah, it just... Yeah, exactly. That, yeah, exactly. Um, have any of you other writers experienced this kind of situation where you feel like either your characters, your book, or yourselves have been judged um, unfairly in this way? Yeah, my character in uh, Women, I was just reading some reviews to brush up for this panel, and <laughs> <laughs> as one does... Although you don't read reviews, Anna. No, I, I you don't. You should teach me about that later. But she gets called, um, she lacks apology, and she's unapologetic, which I find really interesting because it's such a backhanded sort of comment because you see that and you're like, oh, cool, they liked it. And then you're like, oh, what should I be apologizing for? It implies that you're doing something wrong. I think that Jenny has also gotten unapologetic. So I get unapologetic, I get shameless... And yeah, raunchy, if anything, you know, if a woman wants to have sex, she's raunchy. Yeah, or hypersexual. What do you think? Um, I mean, I, I think there's also like, there's like a, there's like different ways of talking about like sex in writing. And I feel like raunchy is a really specific adjective. It kind of almost implies like it's like, an ugly woman trying to like enjoy herself like <laughs> physically and psychically like how dare she like be like having orgasms or like getting what she wants because I feel like there's like other words that people use to like when a woman is like kind of being like beaten into submission sexually I feel like they don't use the word raunchy I feel like they would use like it's so yeah. sensual or it's like so like erotic um, and it's like this is like a woman being like assaulted so I don't know like about <laughs> the erotics of that um, but I feel like um, also because um, I I don't know. I don't I've never heard the word like raunchy or a word like that being used for my, my writing, but I also often wonder if it's because um like it's like there's also like the there's like racial coding of like being like a sort of this like petal like floating on like a lotus like lined <laughs> pond who's like, <laughs> but she's like also like talking really disgustingly about her body, like that somehow doesn't equate to raunchy. So I think that's also part of it. 
Yeah, um, Jenny, I remember when I learned the word raunchy and it was when JFK Jr. got married and there was a rumor that his bride didn't wear underwear under her wedding dress and everyone called her raunchy and so it does, I think, have this connotation of like being like kind of a little bit gross, like not wearing underwear to your wedding. Not that I would judge because don't, don't do it if you don't want to do that. Um, <laughs> it's, it's cool. Um, but I... D- um, I do think there's a really strange, um, and again, I don't, I haven't read any of my reviews because I'm avoidant. Um, so I, I Wait, can you just talk a little more about that? I know, it's so crazy. Um, yeah, I'm really great at avoiding things. It's like an important coping mechanism that I recommend in, in, in moderation, certain things. Um, don't avoid checking your bank balance, but, um, <laughs> uh, but yeah, I don't know. Um, I find even like even like good reviews the times when I've made the mistake of reading them then I'll find like something to be weirded out by or something to be upset about and maybe you know part of it would be things like this where it's like you know is something like unapologetic really a compliment like what is that saying you know and um I think I really prefer like if someone comes up and talks to me about the book, that's really exciting because I get to have like a human interaction. Also, like probably they didn't hate it if they were okay doing that. Um, but to look at it from the remove of like the computer screen reminds me too much of reading the comments, which I also do for my job. And that is a whole other thing that we can talk about later. <laughs> Something also you wish you could maybe avoid. Maybe. Yeah. Um, can you talk? Can you guys all talk a, a little bit about writing or creating these characters? And Jenny, I know you've got a short story collection coming out, but I'm guessing you've written a fair amount of it. Um, yeah. Just, just it's all written. Oh, perfect, wonderful. <laughs> Did the Sh- whole thing. Should come out in 2016. <laughs> uh, but no, could you talk a little bit about when when you're writing these characters and how you feel and like if if this is something that ever crosses your mind, especially after you've released something out into the world and you've kind of gotten this smack back? Like what? W- is it something? Do you find yourself police? Do you find yourself policing yourself? But also on top of that, like, do you kind of say fuck it, or is it something that really doesn't come to mind? You're just trying to write the most honest portrayal you can. Well, I think the most disconcerting thing about that is when you think your character is totally normal, and then you do read their reviews, or someone says something to you, and they've perceived it in such a they they think it's so taboo or whatnot, and you're like, well, I thought that's that's what I'm like, that's what my friends are like, that's what my bubble is like. And then you read a review of how fucked up, you know, your character yes. is. Clear, clearly, you know, I read this book, but I didn't like any of the characters. They were all so selfish, especially the protagonist. Right. Something like that? Right, yeah, super self-absorbed, narcissistic. Yeah. I just didn't relate, and yet somehow I read the whole book. I just couldn't put it down. <laughs> Do you think about this, Jenny? Well, I mean... I don't know. I'm going to like, uh, this is like a, I always wonder about like the MFA versus NYC thing too, because I just have been doing, uh, well, I know, so blah, inside baseball and gross. But like, <laughs> I've just been in so many, I was in so many creative writing, so many fiction workshops, like starting from the age of 17, that there was like, you know, like when you're in that blissful period where you're just writing and you have like no idea like what your writing looks like to the outside world and you're just like this nerd writing like what you're interested in. Um, like that period was like cut woefully short for me because like immediately there were like 30 people in a workshop telling me um, the immorality of like what I was interested in. Um, <laughs> but because of it, I it's like... I never not have a voice in my head that might be, like, a stand-in for, like, just, I don't know, like, a, like a general unhappy person reading my, my work. Like, that, <laughs> that voice is never far from my head, but also it doesn't really matter. It's like, it's like a step parent that I like don't respect like (laughs) they could say anything to me and I'm like but there's no blood between us so like you're always of not high concern for me so that's how I am yeah my real mom fuck you (laughs) it's it's hard I feel like I find myself really caught between like you know, like on an ideal day, probably you're just in like a beautiful, happy zone and you're not thinking about any of these voices. But I also find myself really caught between like that voice and just being like, you know, whatever, you're not my real mom. And then also, (laughs) (laughs) 
And also, like, actual, like, what are valuable voices that I should take in and think about when I'm writing my fiction, because those exist, too. Like, I don't know, Anne Friedman has this whole thing about how to, like, break down haters into people that you should actually listen to versus who you should not listen to. Um, and, like, there are people that you should listen to, but, right. like, usually they're not the ones who are like, I didn't like your character. She was, like, had too much sex or... <laughs> Um, yeah, there's always going to be the troll who tells you to go volunteer in Africa or tells your character to go get some real problems. Right. So, yeah. the, uh, the, Anna, just to jump back to you real quick, the character in Sophie Stark, um, you talk a lot about... Uh, one, if you could... Actually, all of you could talk a little bit about some of the writing that you're doing recently or that's out now. But in, in Sophie Stark, the main character is an, is an artist a passionate artist. Could you, one, explain a little bit about the book for those that haven't read it, and then two, just talk about what it meant for you to make, and here's the thing, like, as you guys are talking about this, I'm catching myself doing it. I'm like, make a character so audacious, and I'm like, don't say that, man. That's a trap. <laughs> you, uh, you're gonna be one of the bad guys. Uh, to, to, to write that character, period, full stop. Uh, sure, thanks, Isaac. Yeah. <laughs> No, that was like weird tonally. I meant that like I meant that with deep sincerity. Um, <laughs> uh, no, but yeah, um, I think I actually, when I thought of Sophie Stark, I thought of her as a really bad person, and so that's one reason that um, you know maybe I wasn't like if someone is a reader and is like, wow, she's such a dick, I would be like, yes, yeah, she's bad. Hang on, tell us a li- just tell us a little bit about the book. Totally, so sorry, please. yeah. Um, so basically, uh, the novel's about a uh, female filmmaker um, and her movies and the people that loved her the most. And the thing about her is that she really has a hard time relating to other people. Um, but she's a really good artist. She's a really good filmmaker. And so she sort of is really very bad to most of the people in her life and sort of exploits them in order to make good movies. Um, And when I was writing about this, I thought a lot about, frankly, a lot of male artists who I think have done that um, and who sort of are celebrated for doing that and there's no problem. And in their biographies, they're like, yeah, you know, stabbed eight wives, but look at the paintings. Um, (laughs) And I wanted to see what that looked like on a woman. Um, the thing that I discovered kind of after I had written it and after it was all done was that it was almost like a fantasy because of course like when women behave really badly and not that I'm endorsing you know stabbing but when women behave really badly they're judged in a very intense way in a very different way from the way that men are judged and you know even a you know very celebrated female artist would not get the same kind of passes you know that a celebrated male artist would get Um, and in my book I almost let Sophie gets some passes, and now that I've, you know, a year out of publication, I'm sort of like, that was an odd moral choice. What is, what is, what is with my brain that I wanted to see this woman, like, get away with a lot of things? But I think part of it is just this fantasy of feeling like, well, you know, all these dudes have gotten to do this throughout the canon. Like, you know, I would like to get a, get a character, get a chance to do this. That's so amazing. Like, the idea that the book is actually a little bit of a fantasy novel in that it is like a almost like a 70s badass lady film, uh, except she gets away with making art and being terrible to people. Yeah. Uh, let's, I, and let's go down the line. Let's wait, just... but first, I need to jump in, and I want to defend your character against you, the author, <laughs> <laughs> which is that I loved Sophie Stark because I saw her as this young woman who just wasn't going to take any shit, and she was going to make her art no matter what, And I mean, so I bought into the fantasy, but also I don't think she was that bad. I think she used people emotionally, but at the same time, you know, she was trying to achieve, she was trying to achieve a higher art. Good, yeah. A lot of people... (laughs) (laughs) Buy the book, because it's great. It's great. Thank you. A lot of people who aren't me have judged her less harshly. It's like when your mom is like, you look terrible today, or whatever. Lots of parent talk. (laughs) My, my mom was great. She it, never said anything like that. No, my mom didn't either. I'm, I'm actually with you, though, Emily. I, too, like, when I read it, I was never, like, uh, like I, I, I was with it. It's, it seemed hyper-realistic to me. So it's just interesting to hear that you, you felt that way. Can you talk a little bit about your book and, uh, and your, your protagonist? Sure. Okay. So my book is called The Blondes, and it's about a world where uh, women are being affected, only women, by this rabies-like virus that makes them rage out but particularly if their hair is blonde or dyed blonde. 
And so they're killing each other and just going crazy. Yeah. So. And, you know, I will say that I have... I'm sorry. I'm really sorry because you're blonde. <laughs> but uh, I have been blonde. And it was different. It was really different than being a brunette. And um, I made the character a redhead. Her name is Hazel because I thought, let's put her in the middle. Let's make her neither a blonde nor a brunette. And, um, and see where she falls in the middle of this chaos. And so Hazel is a grad student, and she's had an affair with her professor who's married. She finds herself pregnant, and she's like, what the am I going to do now? And all around her, blondes are going nuts and attacking people, and women are starting to be incarcerated, and the police are becoming more and more militaristic. I mean, we would never see that. And blondes are being separated out at airports, and she's like, how the hell do I get back because she's studying in New York and she wants to go back to Toronto and figure out what she's going to do and tell this guy. So a lot of people judged her because she had made a critical error. And how, do you, I mean, how did you feel towards her? Well, I think it's interesting because the book was about judgment and how we judge each other based on appearance and also how women find power or how people tear women down, whether it's other women or whether it's men or whether it's the system. So I, it was kind of weird... To, to see the book go out into the world and to have her come under fire because I thought of her as very vulnerable and, you know, I had a deep affection for her. I thought she was someone who had made a couple of bad choices but that otherwise was, you know, a very likable character. She's not a lot like me because she was, like I said, a little bit more halting, I think, than I would be. I'm older than she is and, um, you know, if I found myself in that situation, I would do something else. You know, I would, I would just be like, okay, so we're going to do this now. And she wanders a little bit before she kind of comes into her own. Um, but I, I did know that it was going to be a divisive book because it's feminist. And I said, some people are going to love this type of feminist approach to what is something that's kind of like a thriller and kind of like an action and kind of like a satire. And other people are going to hate it. So I did know that there was going to be kind of a divide. And it's funny, I got an Amazon review, and I do, I really do try not to read them, but I got an Amazon review. Yeah, they, what? Anna <laughs> Norse over here not reading any reviews, like in major publications, you're reading Amazon no, reviews? No, I try not to. I try not to. <laughs> but it got a three star, and I thought this was really funny. This was just like this week. It got a three star. And the person who wrote the review said, I'm, I'm, I'm ranking this for my book club because half of us absolutely loved it and wanted to give it a five star, and the other half hated it and wanted to give it a one star. Aww. You got like a redhead review, actually, right That's there in the middle. <laughs> right, down, <laughs> right down the line. That's awesome. Um, Chloe, a little bit about women. And then also, I would love to hear your thoughts, because you also write about your personal life. You, um, you publish life, life. I know how to say that word. Uh, and you publish personal essays and really uh, kind of dig deep into yourself. And uh, I would, was hoping you could share with the audience maybe a little bit about what that feels like. Sure, yeah. I was thinking about that on the way here, about how my first, my debut book was a book of personal essays. And you kind of screw yourself over when your first book is personal essays because after that, all of your stuff gets treated as nonfiction. So when I published Women, which is a novella, um, I remember the first interview I did, the man asked me, one of his last questions was, well, well women is about, it's a, it's a love affair between two women who are about 19 years apart. And it's uh, about female friendship and this love affair. And one, one woman is uh, gay and out of the closet and the other one is unknown. Um, but so at the end, of the last question of the interview was, what if you run into this woman on the street that you wrote about? And I flipped out and totally reacted, and I jumped down his throat, and I said, <laughs> I said, this is fiction. There's no, so it'd be impossible for me to run into her on the street because I made her up, and, you know, she's an amalgamation of a bunch of people, as is the protagonist, and he apologized, and we, you know, deleted that question, but it comes up again and again. <laughs> Um, another review of women that I was brushing up on on my way here says, it, it's a very nice review, it's in the fanzine, and at, but at one point it says, you know, clearly Chloe Caldwell's favorite subject is Chloe Caldwell. So, and it, it's a very positive review, it's actually written by a friend. Um, it, <laughs> No, no, no. It's a great review. And, and I got what she was saying, and she had some really awesome points. But I was thinking a lot about that line, and it could have been her favorite subject is female friendship or bisexuality or gray area sexuality or all of these different things or uncertainty. But no, it had to be myself. 
um, because it's a book that explores, you know, the self and the unknowing of sexuality. So um, I've kind of got used to it. It is. It does get very frustrating at times. Do you plan on trying to focus more on fiction, or are you? Is personal essay still something that's near and dear to your heart? I would love to go back to fiction just because it's there's like the protective layer, but that said, I'm obviously self-destructive because I have a collection of essays coming out, so <laughs> we'll see. Yeah. That's awesome. Um, thank you. Uh, Jenny, I want to talk a little bit uh, with you. Obviously, any kind of tidbits you can give us about your short story collection that's coming out, yeah. that's going to be great. Um, but also, uh, you, you mentioned earlier just all, how race can be involved with this, and I kind of wanted to share my own little anecdote, uh, which uh, involves Paul Beatty, who uh, won the NBCC this year. He has a great book called The Sellout, which is absolutely wonderful. And in my review of it, I said it was an American class, instant American classic, which is true. Uh, but then I said, that's too hot to handle. And then at the end of the year, when the New York Times put it on its top 10 best of the year list, uh, it literally almost said the exact same thing, uh, too hot to handle. And I, I realized, of course, that's not like, there's, that's just two people that don't know how to talk about a book. <laughs> like, that was fucked up. Like that, and the second I read it, I realized, I was like, oh, I was really bad. I just did something really stupid. Um, and so I actually had a conversation with Paul Beatty where that's the first thing I brought up and we talked for like 20 minutes. It was wonderful in which he was basically like, yeah, uh, this book is satire, but it's also serious and it's all these many, many different things. And again, I recommend this out very much to everyone in this audience. Uh, and he was like, and you were white and didn't know how to talk about it. Um, and so, and, and that is, I mean, that is absolutely the fact. Uh, and it comes up a lot. Uh, today, a, a coworker of mine, Saeed Jones, was talking about how often uh, books by black authors are described as devastating mm -hmm. uh, or, or like, you know, like, like raw. Mm -hmm. um, and so I was wondering if you could talk a little bit, not just on the, gen the gender aspects of it, but uh, the, w the different ways in which race gets interpreted in the way that we talk about work. Yeah. Well, I think it's just this thing when um, there's so little representation of like a certain kind of life or a certain kind of... Um, people, uh, it feels like an amazing discovery and it feels like how could anyone expose themselves this way? Meanwhile, like there's, these lives are like living all around us all the time. They just don't have a chance for many different reasons um, for that exposure. So I think that um, maybe sometimes the stuff I write about, it's just not stuff, it's like something, it's like a story of a type of person that a lot of times people who are reading my writing, it's like they're encountering that person for the first time, even if they're not encountering those desires, or those emotions, or the, like that story could happen to anyone, it's just that the character that I've chosen to write about, which is like often an Asian American woman, is like, that's like not a face and a body that uh, a lot of readers maybe have encountered because there just aren't that many uh, narratives and texts about that. So I think then that creates this sort of feeling like, oh, you were so daring. And it was like, but I was just born and just li and had this brain, like, and, and I care about what I care about. Like, there was no dare involved um, in it. Maybe... Oh, yeah, if, like, brave. Yeah, you were so brave. And it's like, no, I'm just my ego is like so high that I won't stop at anything to like <laughs> get like this story published. Like that's, I don't know, maybe that's brave. I think that's also like sociopathically, like <laughs> ruthlessly, like whatever. Um, but also I was thinking about what you were saying, Chloe. I think also another reason why people get mad at these characters is because they want to believe that you're just writing about yourself, that you're revealing yourself, that you are so proud of this, like, of the way that you are, that you would choose to share it without any apology, without any shame. And there's, like, a real disgust for that. But there's also, like, a bloodthirst, like, in our culture for, like, women to expose themselves to, like, fuck up publicly, to not be good, but to be interesting, to not be, like, you know, uh, on top of it, but to be, like, a mess. I think that's really interesting because I think there's also this idea that women that get things or that become successful, um, and maybe this is something that you were touching on a little bit in Sophie Stark, that there's a resentment there too in the same way as like, oh, how could you, know, how could you be so bold as to, to do that? Or did you really deserve it? Did she write her own book? Was she 
heavily edited? Did a man actually write that book? You know what I mean? Like, I feel like those questions come up again and again around female authors, mm. but not around male authors. Um, who did she fuck? Mm. You know, who does she know? Who are her connections? As opposed to just acknowledging right. women's work. Right. Right? I feel like that's why like those uh, Elena Fronte novels are so, so popular because she won't attach her autobiography to it. She won't let you read her into it. And if she had, I, I don't even know how um, people would be talking about those novels. Do you think people would just be going over her life with a fine tooth comb and being like, what are the similarities? Yeah, I think That's a lot really of conversation would be spent on like, how dare you do this or expose your family, your life and yourself this way. And she is very like, been very insistent of like, that's exactly why I won't say who I am because I, I won't expose any part of myself. And let's not even get into how many people are like, it's a man. Right. right. <laughs> but the, the thing is also, even though she doesn't reveal anything about her life, her life still gets poured over like crazy because everyone assumes that the novels are completely autobiographical. And even, you know, when there was speculation about like, oh, it might be this Italian professor, people were like, picking through and being like, oh, well, she lived in Pisa in the 60s yeah. and whatever. And it's like, she can't escape it no matter what. Yeah. Um, but I do think there's this like very strange double-edged hunger for women's personal experiences. Yeah. And on the one hand, it can be great because it's like there are a lot of readers for, you know, very personal stories of women's lives. And then, you know, that changes people to be able to read that. And then on the other hand, I do think there's a, a really serious and, you know, the more the like more marginalized as a woman you are, the more this is the case that people treat you as though you can only be an expert on yourself. Mm -hmm. And so the only story you would have to tell is your own. And any story you tell must be your own, mm -hmm. even if it's fiction. Mm -hmm. What I worry about also is that we're approaching literature, I think, more and more, and certainly not everybody. Like, you know, I think that everyone who's come out in this room is here because they're really interested in what's happening um, in our interpretation of fiction. As I feel like we're approaching it more and more passively, where it's like a movie and I'm just here to be entertained. And the idea that the reader is not involved right. in interpreting the character, right? Like, I think that we have to have flawed characters, and the reader is part of that process. They're part of interpreting who that character is. And, and that's how... Sorry, go. Oh, I was just going to say, you think about someone like Eileen Miles, who her book, like, Chelsea Girls, is fiction. It's called, you know, right? It's stories but she uses her own name as her character. And so I, I often wonder, I didn't put a character's name in my book, Women, and so um, everyone placed it on me. Maybe I should have just so used brave. my name. It was very brave. It was shameless and unapologetic. Really raw. Just so raw of you to do that. No, but, keep going. But you wonder, because no one, she seems to get away with it in some sense. I'm not sure what that is, but she uses, she calls herself Eileen, but she is the first to say, it's a version of me, you know, it's my character, Eileen, so. A lot of this discussion's reminding me of the interview that just went up with Monica Lewinsky, mm -hmm. which I feel like if you haven't had the time to read, you should make the time to read. It's very interesting. Um, and just the fact that we're already talking about women that have done this in the past. I was wondering if you could each talk about a character or writer and or both of uh, women that you admire who, who you feel like really do have kind of like broke, broken through this barrier and like really just like say fuck it to it and just done themselves right. I mean, obviously Eileen Miles jumps to mind. Yeah. Jill Soloway, definitely. She's, you know, and she, if anyone doesn't know, he or she has a book of essays that was released many uh, years ago, 10 years ago or whatnot, and now she's you know famous for Transparent, but I recently listened to her talk on Mark Marin, and she has been at this for so long trying to break down this wall, and the last thing she says to Mark Marin on the WTF podcast is, oh, I don't think anyone's interested in my feminist ways. No one, you know, no one cares what I have to say, and then look at her now. So she's a really big inspiration for me. Um, yeah, I mean, this is maybe a little bit of a cop-out almost, because I don't know if she would say she's breaking through anything, and this book came out a long time ago, but um, if anybody's read uh, Sarah Suleri's book, Meatless Days, totally go read it. Um, they're essays, and they're totally personal, and, um, I, and they came out, you know, long before the personal essay was the kind of internet think piece thing that it is now, um, but they are 
totally unapologetic to use <laughs> to use that word um, about their personalness, but they also like really insist on themselves as being not universal in any way, but like this is important. I've written an important essay about my friend Tom and the size of his head. Um, you're gonna read this important essay about how I feel about Tom's head, um, you know, or my other friend who drinks Coke out of a baby bottle. I still remember this. I haven't read this book in probably 20 years. Um, it's one of my favorites. I need to reread it. But anyway, the point is just that like these essays are about details of a woman's life, and in some ways they're mundane details, and yet you never feel like she thinks these things are small, and so the challenge to the reader is to be like, no, these are not small. This is a person's life. This is the most important thing there is and the only thing there is. Um, I, for, I really like this poet, Chelsea Minnis. I don't know if anyone's into her. Um, she doesn't like even publish anymore, but her, I think one of her first books was called Bad Bad. Um, and it's, it's like, even the format is kind of tiring. It's literally just like, a sentence followed by like ellipses that go on for the whole page. Um, <laughs> but I really like her, and I also I was thinking about Sheila Hetty's book, How Should a Person Be, where she her, the main character is Sheila, and people um, I feel like either like love that book or they're like uh, enraged to the point of like wanting to like just like carve out physical violence around the spaces that they're in because they're like so upset that it, I don't know it's like people get so upset that someone would 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 like choose to write this and share it with the world um, and I, I'm one of the people who really likes that book I think it's like amazing Sheila's a good friend because I lived in Toronto for a long time so I was emerging as a writer at the same time as Sheila and it's interesting that you bring her up is because I think that she would be you know, as a writer, one of those examples of writers that people had a reaction to where they had to say some of those things, like there is a lot of language that get gets used around women's writing, and one of them is to call a woman young or an ingenue, yeah. and we don't see that with male writers. And she was young, but when you start hammering it in every single article or review how young the author is or calling them an ingenue, you know, in a way it starts to diminish, I think. Yeah. You know, it, it becomes diminutive, even though obviously she's not, and she's an amazing writer. Um, but it, it just, it reminded me of that. And that's something, I mean, I'm, I don't want to say how old I am, but I've written three novels, and for every one, I've been a young novelist, and I'm like, how, how is this possible, you know? Yeah. <laughs> right. Well, it's like the, word, the opposite for women is to be old, which is completely unacceptable, so. Yeah. <laughs> There's that, too. It's like, you, you better be young, yeah. I guess, right? Um, but I got that, too. I, I, that's actually, um, I found that a really strange thing. When my first novel came out, I was 28, um, which is an age to have, and I guess it's under, it's, <laughs> <laughs> like, it's under 30, um, but I remember having a conversation with, like, I think an Australian radio show, and they were like, can we talk about your age? Oh, my God. And I was like, have you been misinformed about my age? Like, I'm not 19. But I did, I did find it this really strange, like, I didn't think a 28-year-old male writer, but, you know, it's, like, youngish, but what? Exactly. I mean, men who are 30 or 35 are not called ingenues. No, but women are. Um, it, it's very strange to me. And it's also this interesting thing where you have to attach a word. You can't just be a woman. Right. Like, right. sorry, that's going to be the best thing I say all night. <laughs> that was it. That was like my good thought. Tweet that. Yeah, man. Yeah, feel free. Uh, but no, it is, but, but right? Like, I feel like no one can just say, like, this is a woman. Like, there has to be a descriptive word. There has to be something to, like, kind of help you picture where it's just like, um, we wouldn't even talk. Like, if it's, it's just a writer, it's a male writer, it's a, ma it's a writer. I don't know if... Oh, yeah. I've never been an essayist or a writer. Um, I've always been young or candid or brave or daring. Yeah. Yeah. Well, Especially young at first. Young also implies, like, you're sloppy and you're irresponsible. Yeah. Like, you just artlessly, like, vomited all your thoughts from your diary and just, like, printed it out and, like, bound it. And it's, like... <laughs> I don't know, and it's like, but, but it's also like weird because it's such a loaded term because like you're saying like the opposite is just old. It's to, it's to be a hag. Yeah, it's to be a hag, and like, and like women are encouraged to be like young and encouraged to have that spirit, encouraged to not know too much about themselves. They're encouraged to like be sexy without knowing it, and I feel like it's almost like these books where the character is like sexy but she knows it is like a crime against humanity because it's like how dare she be aware of like her effect on the world and like what she can do and what her limits are. But this is just it. I wonder if we're looking to books at this period in 
in time for some kind of morality because we're we feel like we don't have a morality or something like that, that therefore female characters have to be that much more heroic, whether they're written by men, whether they're written by women, that they sometimes, you know, they have to be this, you know, absolute virtuousness and that they have to take care of society and, and comfort everybody. And yeah. I, f I feel like the next time a panel like this happens, it should just all be male editors and critics and they have to have this conversation. Yeah. Like that's that's what should that's what it should be. But so. I think that you know it's not these reviews aren't just coming from men; they're coming from women too. And and it's our perspective as well when we when we approach at work. Yeah, absolutely. Right. That's so true. Um, I feel like I could listen to you guys talk all evening, but I have to stop hogging you now uh, and actually open it up to all these incredibly smart, <laughs> wonderful people uh, for questions from the audience. Um, so if you have a question, I'm gonna do a quick preface. Uh, not about Prince, but I am going to say, uh, please make sure it's a question. Uh, think about the point you want to figure out. Think about the, the access you have to these incredible writers and the knowledge you want to gain from them. Uh, let's not have any uh, more of a comment uh, where you just tell us about your life story. In the back. Do you mean sex or sexuality? I think I'm just going to skip that question, sir. I appreciate it, but I don't think we're here to talk about sexuality in the real world and how they use it to level playing fields. But... Oh, I'll speak, okay. to, I'll speak to it. Yeah, I apologize. Can you repeat the question, though? Well, I don't know if I can repeat the question. <laughs> the question is about using sexuality in the real world and how sexuality affects the real feminist issues. Sort of? Sometimes women are criticized. Yeah, for their sexuality. For their sexuality. In, in, the real world, but also in the writing. In the re real world, but also in the writing. There's nothing wrong with being a sexy woman. I'm just going to keep repeating you. In the real world, men have the advantage in a lot of ways. So All right. My question is, what are, do you feel that it makes sense for women to use whatever they can bring to the uh, Do I feel it makes sense for women to use whatever they can bring to the table in order to further... Further what? Further, further the writing? for the careers? Okay, here's what I'm going to tell you. Um, so my novel came out in hardcover last year. It's now in paperback. When it came out in hardcover, it got reviewed in Entertainment Weekly. That day I got two dick pics. And I said to myself, oh my God, does that mean I've made it? Yeah. Um, I'm so and glad it, dick pics came up, though. It, in some ways, it, it does, which is a really sad and scary thing. Um, is there anything I can do to further my career using my sexuality? I don't think so. But I do think that all female authors know that appearance on stage is something that matters. Appearance in author photos is something that matters far more than it does in a male author photo. I mean, men can take something that looks like a mugshot and put it on their books. And, you know, we've all dressed up to be here and we look, we look fucking great. <laughs> but I don't think that we're using our sexuality per se. I mean, I think that's just acknowledging that there are, there are differences in perception. Fair. Next question. Go ahead, miss. So the question is, uh, are as we've... Harsh, or are they, like, what, what is it like in between women in that space, not just men? As we talk about criticism and, and we talk about 
getting work reviewed. Uh, the question is kind of about ratios, uh, male to women reviewers, and then also uh, more about w what it's like to be critiqued by uh, female critics. I guess I'll take this. Uh, <laughs> um, women, I would say, reviewed my book, Women More, but men also reviewed it. I get way more emails from women, and in my writing classes, I get mostly <laughs> Women. Um, someone just asked me about that. And I don't know if I hadn't written that book, if I'd get more or less women or men or whatnot. Um, I do have to say, same as the review I was talking about earlier, where that woman said that my favorite subject is myself. Um, I, I, I did feel a little like, but you're, you know, yeah, like, don't you get it? You're, you know, you're also a woman. But I think it's, I think it's fair. I think it's, I think it's good that, you know, just because you're a woman doesn't mean you get let off the hook. But I would say, of that book, women would write m much more thoughtful reviews, and men would just m more say, oh, I had no idea any of this was even going on. Like, thanks for opening my eyes. But, um, yeah, that's just been my experience. I haven't gone through, and I kind of, you know, I, I look at everything with, like, a gauze over it. I haven't gone through and really thought about the ratio of men to women reviewing. Yeah, I, I would say I, I find, um, I think in, in all my writing and all my sort of experiences getting critiqued at different levels of life, um, the kinds of responses that I get from male readers about male characters are really interesting. I don't, I haven't even seen that big of a discrepancy in terms of responses I get from men and women about female characters. Often they will be similar, but I think men can be very taken aback sometimes when women try to write about men. Um, and I've seen like both sides of that coin where like sometimes a man will say like, oh, like men are such jerks, like they don't think this much, like this is so unrealistic, like a man would never have this internal monologue. Um, you know, and the, on the other side, like the maybe more fair, like, oh, you haven't really understood masculinity, you don't understand what it is to be a man. That's, I sort of prefer that to the idea that men don't have brains. That seems <laughs> very misandrist. <laughs> you, I feel like you were like, yeah, yeah, no. I, I don't have anything to add. <laughs> I, I've actually, I've had some surprisingly good reviews from men, and considering my book is about hair, a lot of men have their own hair issues, is what I found out. Absolutely. <laughs> All right, let's keep this going. Oh my God, there's so many great questions. All right, way in the back. That's you, miss. Oh, well, I, um, <laughs> I, I write poetry, essays, and fiction, and have been, uh, like, I've used the first person so much, I basically strangled it with desire and affection, um, and other things, but uh, I'm really excited to write um, fiction in, like, a detached third person point of view. I don't know. Like that's a really technical thing I'm really into doing, but I think that answers your question. Uh, my next book is about men primarily. So I don't know if I'm going to wind up on a panel about men in fiction, but um, <laughs> it will be very different than this one. It's about prohibition. It's set in uh, Detroit in the twenties and uh, it's called men walking on water. I'm worried though, because the characters are very, very unlikable. <laughs> Yeah, but they're men, so it'll be fine. Yeah. That's a... just our charm. <laughs> ah, we're just drunks. It's okay. Sorry, that was bad. Um, I'm trying to write a Western right now. Um, oh. And that's been... <laughs> Everybody be cool. Um, <laughs> it's been fun. Um, I'm trying to really play with ideas of gender in my Western. And so for that, I've been reading a lot of Crazy Cat, which I recommend to anyone who's interested in gender or the West. Um, I would like to try the screenplay format. Um, and similarly to Jenny, I'm, I've done, and we for, all forgot to talk about this, but we talked about it earlier in email, just how you get treated when you write in first person as opposed to, which one of your books is in third person? One of you had mentioned. Oh, yeah. I think I said mine is all uh, Sophie Stark never gets to talk in the book, and so people are only talking about her, so the sort of bad woman is only ever referred to and never speaks, right. which I thought might like blunt some criticism? Right, yeah. I would also like to try third person and, and screenplays. All right. Yes, miss. Uh, this is for everyone, but I especially for Emily, about how the topic, 
and you write about violence, maybe, and how when, when women write something that may be considered as violence, or a violent scene, or an action scene, sci-fi, fantasy, like we talked about, something that's considered male-dominated, how, A, do you go about writing that, and B, have you had any reactions that were interesting, po problematic, or just how did people perceive that as you were writing violent scenes? Can you repeat the question back shorthand? Yeah, yeah, the question was about as a woman who writes very violent scenes, how do people react to that violence? Um, and I'm really not sure because that's not something that's been mentioned much in the reviews. And I do think that my book is quite violent. I mean, when I wrote it, it was kind of, you know, it started as a joke and a way to explore what I see happening in the world in terms of just the discrimination that occurs, not just against women, but in general. Um, and I felt like violence had to come into it in some way, um, that there needed to be a level of anger that was explored. Um, but I really, I don't see it in the reviews, so it's interesting, I'm not sure. Um, except to say that it might, it might be sort of what I was saying about that people are offended by the fact that there's not a morality, not an easy morality in the book. Um, I don't know. But that's, I mean, that's also such an American thing though, right? Like, a whole book of people getting killed, no problem. Oh shit, sex? Yeah. Like that's like, right? We do that with movies all the time. It's like, oh, kids can go watch all of New York be torn up by aliens, like no problem, but God forbid they see a titty. Um, yeah. So I feel like that, like, that, like, that, is, a, that is a tough thing. Uh, what about like writing, I mean, poetry, like the, these different ways in which in, in you attack these novels. Uh, ha, have, you ever, have you ever felt like you are kind of the, the one woman in the room, almost to put it that way. Have you ever felt like, as a writer, you were kind of in this area that felt male dominated and how did that feel? Well, I also think like violent, it's so interesting because so much actual violence is directed at women. So it's like, uh, why wouldn't you use your subjectivity as a woman or if you're writing about women um, to like, fill out like the picture of like violence and how that happens. And I'm thinking again of like Elena Fronte and how violence and anger and, and female rage is such a big part of um, like the Neapolitan novels that they're being beaten on, but they're also kind of beating each other and beating like their men. And I feel like that's like a subjectivity that maybe, it's again the thing I was saying earlier, when you don't see enough of it, when there's so few depictions, it feels um, like there's not a sophisticated enough language to talk about it when, when women do write about it. Well, it's almost like you get to be a victim and that's it. That's right. what you get. And you right. get it in fiction and you get it in the world. Just right. be a victim. Right. Like, uh, which I'm, obviously I'm not condoning. I'm saying like that's... <laughs> <laughs> Right. But yeah, I, I mean, I find the violence in the front end novels really striking and interesting. And she talks about it very, she's not, she, the narrator is very aware of it too. She's like, this was an extremely violent time. Yeah. You know, it's not just like, this is how, it, it's not uncommented upon. And it's also like how fiction does something that like journalism can't, for example, like because there is such a problem of like domestic violence against women, you can't talk about in a, in a 700 word article where like a guy is beating up his wife about like her hitting him because it undermines the bigger problem, which is like men are like beating on women so much more. Um, but in fiction, you, you do get to talk about that in interesting and fruitful ways where you can even talk more about that than and, like the message of like what needs to happen in like our society to make it safer for women. I did, um, I did sort of experience this this kind of like only woman in the room thing. I sort of experienced actually with my first novel, and in that case, it, I mean that's a violent novel. Um, and in that case, it was an interesting case because it's you know sort of like a post-apocalyptic hellscape where a lot of bad things happen <laughs> to a lot of people, good and bad. Um, and I think because the main character of the novel is an 18 year old woman and she very much would say she's a woman, like she has a job, like she has to deal with her own shit all the time. She, you know, is not a child. Um, but it sort of was, it both was marketed and I think in some cases received as YA. So and in that case, I was not yet wise enough to not read some reviews. So I did read some Amazon reviews and people were really shocked. They were like, this is way too dark and violent to be a YA novel. Like my teenager was very disturbed 
disturbed. And I would sort of be like, oh, no, I'm sorry. This is not necessarily <laughs> like... But it was interesting that because it featured a teenage character, it sort of goes back to this youth thing, that it was assumed that this would be for teenagers and that it would be light. Um, and of course, a lot of YA is very dark and violent, so, you know. We're going to go back and then back. So, yeah, you? Tell us about good women. I was, I was, I'm sorry. You go. I was thinking about that when we were talking about the unapologetic word, because I was thinking, what would a book look like if on every page it's like, then I ordered a beer. Sorry about that, you know, the way we do in real life. (laughs) What would an apologetic novel or essay look like? I'm so confused about that. So I'm glad that you brought that up, is what I'm saying. Um, Yeah, I think the good woman is just supposed to, yeah, be polite and keep her legs closed and and the end has to be incredibly redemptive for people to feel good about themselves yeah and I guess I never answer this is related to the question Isaac posed to me that I never answered earlier of like what (laughs) my short story collection is about but it's about um, these young immigrant um, girls uh, Chinese American immigrant girls who like aren't grateful that they came to America and they aren't grateful uh, for anything and they're angry and they're like very, very rageful and they're very hard to love. And I was thinking like that, that the other side of that are like these, like the joy, I don't know, like I'm not trying to diss on the joy like club, but like that, that immigrant novel about women who suffer without end and they're not angry. Like they're not angry at racism or like imperialism or colonialism or capitalism. They're just sad and like it's divorced from any kind of like thing. It, it's divorced from sort of like any kind of like real oppression or any anger. Um, and I feel like that's almost like the good woman. It's not a bad thing, but it almost feels like that's the first stage of like a character who doesn't, whose story doesn't get told is you have to have a really good version of that person. The person who gets like sexually assaulted and she's not angry, she's just traumatized. Yeah. And then it's like somehow it's open a, just a little bit for like the angry woman, the woman who wants to like cut off like that guy's like whatever important parts. <laughs> cut off his dick. <laughs> yeah, I don't know why I didn't want to say dick. <laughs> you were trying to be good. I'm good. Yeah, I was trying to be really good. <laughs> um, yeah, I've been really trying to like steal back for women and for female characters the idea of the hero, which I think is a, a type of good man that, that people get to be in fiction, um, where like maybe he has flaws and maybe he did some bad things, but he like has done heroic acts and like gotten the golden fleece or whatever. Um, and I really want that archetype also to be for women. That's like, I think a much like stronger and more exciting way to be like capital G good than to just like not like get a beer, which I think is the way that is encouraged for women to be good. Get a beer and then apologize for it. Right, yeah. yeah. Um, we have time for one more. Well, sort of in, in following up on what you were just talking about, with not wanting to say the word dick, um, <laughs> it's just that, you know, here you are, this panel is about being, like, about bad women and likability, and I'm wondering how you all handle that outside of your books, because do you still like to be liked? Do you still want to be nice? Do you still not want to say the word fuck in a room when this, our moderator was happy to say it? And like, I noticed none of you said it, you kind of whispered it. It's a place I feel like women are still stuck, and I'm wondering how you guys handle that outside of your writing. Can you repeat, just say it out loud? <laughs> okay, no, I, I, I can do it. Uh, just, uh, all right, we're talking about characters, and we're talking about fiction, we're talking about unlikable characters, uh, but is, it, is there still a drive as a human person to be uh, prim, proper, and likable? I crave so much acceptance. I want to be liked so much. I want to be like, you know, I want everyone to say good things about me all the time. You know, it's really bad, actually. My father at one point said to me, Emily, like, you can't go through life that way. You're not going to make anyone happy. You're not going to make everyone happy. You just can't do it. 
And uh, hearing that, I think, from a parent was really important because it was just that moment where I let go. And that's when I started writing what I wanted to write. And, <laughs> you know, my first book of short stories was published with a tiny, tiny press. And when I gave it to my parents, I sliced four stories out that I didn't want them to read. <laughs> Yet, somehow, I left in one of the ones that had anal sex in it. I don't know. <laughs> So, you know, in retrospect, I might have sliced them all out if I really wanted my parents to still like me. But, but at, at the same time, you have to, you do have to get over it. And you have to know that if you're going to try to proceed in fiction or in writing in general, you're going to have to turn into a tough-ass bitch. And somebody's going to say bad things about you behind your back. You're going to get called a bitch. You better get called a bitch or you're not going to get anywhere, right? If you just... So it is weird. It's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a push and pull all the time. I've been thinking a lot about this, actually. Like, in my books, I could give two fucks if I'm liked. That's my place to be whatever I want. But I noticed the more I write and the more I publish, the more I want to be liked in real life. Whereas when I didn't have any books out, I didn't think about being liked because I wasn't a public you know, person. I didn't have people knowing anything about me. So it's like... Yeah, the more honest I am in my work, in real life, and people are like, what a psycho, you know, in real life, I want to be like, no, I'm normal, you know, so it's, it's <laughs> the more about me that's out there, the more in real life I, I do want to be liked, um, and, but in my, I never ever think about my characters being likable or myself being likable when I'm actually writing, I don't care about that person, but face to face I do. This yeah. is something Jenny was saying earlier, between us is there's sometimes that disconnect between when people meet you and your work where people are like oh you, you look like such a nice girl right or what was it that, that someone said to you when you came off a of stage oh, I was just saying like because I do a lot of poetry readings and um, I, oftentimes people would come up to me and be like oh like there's such a difference between your like sweet soft voice and your like doll like demeanor and like that you're talking about like cum farts or whatever <laughs> And, um, you know, as if, like, all throughout the world, you know, Britney Spears is both, like, a virgin and, like, making out with Madonna. Like, that's, that's like, the, that's a type of, that's actually an archetype, and that's actually an archetype for a reason, because if Britney Spears, uh, when Britney Spears became who she, like, truly is, which is a Cheeto-loving, like, walking into breast, public restrooms without shoes on. She wasn't loved, and she couldn't have been kissing Madonna on stage at that point. She had to be kissing Madonna on stage when she was, like, beautiful and prim and sweet and unsullied. So, like, I guess related to your question, like, and related to what you were saying, Chloe, there, and the whole thing we've been saying of, like, when, you're, when your work is read autobiographically and people are waiting and you're writing about women fucking up, like, I'm very aware that I can't be fucking up at, like, a business meeting. I can't, like, show up late because they're already expecting me to based on, like, these characters who can't, like, get their underwear on before they leave the house. And I want to be, like, look at me, like, not only is my underwear so on, like, I'm... <laughs> I am, like, so incredibly polite and nice and sweet, and, like, I am, like, so able to do, like, any business transaction um, while, like, writing about these characters that you might think come from my life and come from who I am. Yeah, while you guys have been talking, I've been thinking about times in my life when I've been called a bitch or worse stuff, um, which is, like fairly, I mean, in comments all the time, but in person, it's super rare. And one of those reasons is that I'm super nice, which is not a, it's like a really complicated quality. It's not always good. It's like, I actually, usually when someone t when is like, oh, you're so nice, I'm like, ooh. <laughs> like, that means I'm sort of a doormat. And so if I think about the times when someone called me a bitch, I'm like, okay, like, that was hurtful and, some, you know, could be scary and it's a slur and all this stuff. And at the same time, it's like, okay, well, those must be times when I stood up for myself and did something kind of strong. So, which is sad. Yeah. But also, it's like, okay, it's in a way good to keep a tally of that so you remember. Yeah. Um, I think on that note, I feel like that's uh, a good note to end on, both standing up for oneself, being called a bitch, and, uh, and almost owning and taking that word back in a way. Um, but ladies and gentlemen, will you please join me in thanking our guests? Again, we have Anna North, Emily Schultz, Chloe Caldwell, and Jenny Zhang. Come on. <laughs>